to give an opening statement, and I stated to you that a, an opening statement, simply put, is a, like a road map of what each attorney expects the evidence is going to show. Traditionally, the prosecution goes first. Are you prepared to go forward, Mr. Oliver? Yes. You may. Johnny, just so the court knows, uh, juror 12 and opening six switch seats for his uh, medical issue. Okay, very good. Noted. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the evidence in this case is going to show that Dr. Amy Harwick was murdered by defendant Garrett Kershaus because he was obsessed with her. She rejected his advances. Not only that, she cut off all contact. And to punish her for that, he broke into her house on Valentine's Day. He broke in there with a syringe loaded with a lethal dose of nicotine. And then he waited for her until she got home. at this time opportunity to give an opening statement and I stated to you that a, an opening statement simply put is a, like a road map of what each attorney expects the evidence is going to show. Traditionally the prosecution goes first. Are you prepared to go forward Mr. Oliver? Yes. You may. Johnny just so the court knows uh, juror 12 and opening six switch seats for his uh, medical issue. Okay very good. Noted. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the evidence show that Dr. Amy Harwick was murdered by defendant Garrett Kershaus because he was obsessed with her. She rejected his advances. Not only that, she cut off all contact. And to punish her for that, he broke into her house on Valentine's Day. He broke in there with a syringe loaded with a lethal dose of nicotine. And then he waited for her until she got home. He waited there for hours for her. When she arrived, she went up to her third story bedroom and got caught by surprise by the defendant. He immediately attacked her, as evidence will show. He strangled her. And then her roommate, who was asleep in the bottom level, heard the screaming and yelled out, leave her alone. The evidence is going to show the defendant panic at that moment. Took Amy Harwick, debilitated body, over to her bedroom balcony. Lifted her up over the balcony and dropped her to her death. You're going to hear that she suffered injuries to her body. Her pelvis was shattered liver damage, brain damage, and then defendant fled the scene. Now, this opening statement is a roadmap. It's a preview of the evidence we, know we expect to show you in this trial. And the reason why it's good to pay attention to these previews is because when we call witnesses, we are not able to call witnesses in the order you would expect them as things happen. We're bringing in witnesses from out of the county. We have to accommodate their schedule. So you will hear witnesses who may have known something that happened later in time testify first just to accommodate their schedule. But this will help you understand the evidence and how things happen. So let's get right into it. Amy Pursehouse and Gareth, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehouse dated back about 10 years ago, and they dated for only about a year and a half, as the evidence will show. 
In 2012, Amy obtained a restraining order against the defendant and ended the relationship. And then she had no more contact. Amy moved on with her life. She cut off all contact with the defendant. She became Dr. Amy Harwood. She obtained a doctorate in sexual behavior and then became a licensed marriage and family therapist. In 2020, now we're at the year when these things are going to happen. And the way things happen is her friend, Dr. Hernando Chavez, and her were going to go to a conference. Uh, they work as therapists with the adult industry, helping people in that industry who may need therapy. And they were invited to an ex-biz show. Ex-biz is an you know, adult entertainment uh, convention where they award adult entertainers uh, awards. And as therapists, they were invited to conferences there. Uh, and she went to one on the 14th. And by going to the conference, you get to go to the awards show. It's a red carpet show. And both Dr. Chavez and Amy Harwick went there. And they were excited to network there. So you're going to hear from Dr. Hernando Chavez. He's going to tell you what happened on that day. They went to the Marriott Hotel. She was ex doc she'll tell you that. Uh, Dr. Harwick, Amy Harwick was excited to be there. But that all changed when the defendant was there. The defendant that had been hired to work as a photographer. The defendant's actually a computer programmer, but one of his side jobs is to become a, is to, is, is as a photographer. And he was there. Dr. Amy Harwick did not expect that. And Fernando Chavez will tell you that he was he went to go get drinks for a moment and left Amy by the red carpet and then he was called back. He said, you better get back here. There's a commotion happening. And as he got back there, he could see that the defendant was crying, was upset, and he could see that Dr. Amy Hollick was trying to calm him down. And as he got closer, he heard the defendant tell Amy Harwick, you ruined my life, bitch. Referring to their relationship and how it ended. Dr. Harwick tried to appease him. She was embarrassed about the situation, as Mr. Hernan that Dr. Hernando Chavez would tell you. She tried to appease the defendant at that point, who appeared distraught. At some point, Dr. Hernando Chavez said, okay, it's time for us to go. We talked to him. We need to go to the red carpet. And was able to take her away. From that point on, her demeanor changed. She was making the best of it. She was putting on a face now. She was taking photographs at the red carpet. She went and sat down at her table for the convention. And she was there, but Hernando Chavez will tell you what her, how her demeanor changed. She was stoic. But as this award ceremony was about to end, the defendant approached her again and asked if he could talk to her. She told uh, Dr. Hernando Chavez, let me talk to him, and went a short distance away to talk to him, to try to calm the situation down. some point within 45 minutes of that conversation that ended and she and Dr. Hernando Chavez left the Marriott Hotel. And they went to the parking lot and she was supposed to go to another show but she canceled it. She said, I'm not going there. I need to talk to you. We need to go to a restaurant where I need to talk to you about what just happened. And as they got into her car at the Marriott Hotel, she looked behind to see if, there were, if she was being followed. They then go to the restaurant, and Amy tells them about her interaction with the defendant, and how she's afraid of him, and how she needs to increase security at her home, how she needs to get pepper spray or something because of the way he's acting, obsessive. Dr. Hernando Chavez offered to uh, go with her home. She said, no, it's okay. I'll go home on my own. And then they parted ways. This takes us to the next day. That morning, that same morning, 
following morning at 3.09 a.m., Dr. Howard gets to her home and she writes an email to herself. In this email, she documents what just happened with the defendant and her fears of what can happen to her at his hands. She writes, and there's a date, January 17, 2020, at 3.09 a.m. Tonight, I felt very scared. I went to the award show with Hernando. When we arrived, we waited in a very long line to do the red carpet. As we were waiting, I saw Garrett walk by with a camera. Cle clearly, he was working. I decided to ignore him and just stop looking at that direction. I thought maybe he could not notice me. <coughs> I'll show you another part of this email where she states, up and shaking violently, meaning the defendant was shaking violently when he was talking to her. I was scared and felt like I needed to neutralize the situation. I don't think he was gonna attack me in that moment, but this clearly showed me how obsessed he was. He told me that he thinks about me every day and every day he cries. He told me he lost his job when we broke up because he couldn't work. He told me that no matter what he did, he couldn't stop obsessing over me. He told me that I was a cheater and a liar because he thought we were still together when I believed that we were broken up. He recited text messages that I had sent from this time frame about nine years ago. He recited the date, who they were to, and exactly what was said word for word. I couldn't believe it. I was very scared. He said he wasn't able to move on, but he's dated, but nobody with me. He said he thinks about me constantly. She wrote this email to herself. She didn't send it to anyone, as you will hear. At the end of the conversation, I told him my friend Hernando was waiting for me. I asked him how he would like to end this conversation. I told him that we don't have to be brutal enemies. I told him that we will not be friends and we will not be talking, but that we don't have to be enemies. I told him that I was genuinely sorry for anything that I did that was hurtful all of those years ago, and I told him that I forgave him. He asked for a hug, and I told him that was not a good idea. He started to cry. Eventually, he walked away. Fernando and I went towards the escalator to go towards the vehicle. So that's an email that she wrote to herself that's brought in for her state of mind to show you what her state of mind was right after her interaction with the defendant. Well, that same day, the day after the Exodus Awards show, defendant text messages Amy Harlow. He states, I interneted your number Recognize it now. I see it, if I'm allowed. He finds her number on the internet and texts her at that point. Prior to this, you'll see that the phone records, evidence will show that the phone records from Amy Harwood, she was never contacting the defendant. And then he engaged in text messages with her. She culminates that brief interchange of text messages where he wants to talk to her, he wants to meet with her, with the following. First he states, not sure if you're done, because you said, how do we finish this now last night? But if we can meet again, she responds, I think it was really good that we were able to speak last night. I'm sure there's a lot more that you want to pr process and say to me, but I think that was a lot for both of us. I hope you were able to hear me last night when I said that I was sorry for anything that caused you suffering and that I forgave you for the things that you did to me. I think right now it's best to have some space, and I don't mean that in a negative way. The past is sad and triggering for both of us. I think we ended our talk last night well. We can be civil from distance, respect each other, and move forward with our lives. So that's what she responded to end this conversation with the defendant, but he replied, and you'll have these text messages as part of the evidence, so you're still just gone, which is exactly my nightmare, and sadly what I expected. Amy Harwick, just a little bit later, at around 1.22 p.m., texts Hernando Chavez and tells him, 
Gareth found my number online and messaged me. I told him I didn't want to talk and wished him the best, but his response was still obsessive and scary. Handy Mike comes tomorrow for more locks on my windows and ordered pepper spray. These statements are brought in, will be brought in to show her state of mind at the time how she feared the defendant. She further texts, Thanks, I set a boundary over text and I'm not responding after that. He keeps texting me and sounds unstable. Well, defendant, the evidence will show the defendant continues to text message her at 2 p.m. and at 6.45 p.m. and she does not respond. The following day, she text messages her good friend Robert Koshland and more statements of her state of mind. I ran into my scariest ex last night of 10 years. He yelled at me in public and then acted really crazy and told me how obsessed with me he was. I tried to de-escalate him. Things he said were very scary. Took safety measures today, but realistically scared for my safety. My anxiety isn't bad now, just realistically thinking something could happen to me. Then you'll hear from Robert Koshland that she provided uh, she got an app where he could follow her, the location of her phone. The following day, on the 13th, defendant leaves a voicemail message crying, asking to talk to her, that he has so much to say to her. Amy ignores the voicemail message and actually blocks it at that point. So he cannot have any contact with her. She increases home security, gets new locks, security cameras on the mid-level, not on the third level. And then we move on to Sunday. So at this point, she's blocked this number so he can no longer contact her, as evidence will show. She tells her friend Grace Stanley that she is going to get pepper spray. I blocked him through text, message, but because his level of obsession, and I definitely don't think I'm in the clear. I have pepper spray at the house now. My roommate is on alert. I'm upping my home security. That's her state of mind at that point. She tells her roommate, Michael Herman, about her fears and to be on alert. This is the roommate who will testify and will tell you that his room is on the bottom level. The mid-level, it's like the living room. The third level is her bedroom. She has a home at 2086 Mount Street in the Hollywood Hills. This is a 3D image of what the home looks like. So in this case, you'll be able to know uh, the different levels uh, of the property and where the various rooms are that are going to be relevant in this case. <coughs> so this will be her back patio, the concrete patio. Her balcony will be on the third level. That will be her bedroom. The front of the home, the garage, the media room, the TV room on the third floor, the front door, the living room, and French doors. And you see, you'll be able to see that those French doors are recessed behind the door. The back part of the building has Michael Herman's bedroom on the lower level. There's the patio, there's her balcony to her third, be third floor bedroom. Points out to the living room and the media room. Now, in this case, uh, we're going to present evidence of her neighbor's property because evidence will show that that's how the defendant got to her home. So the property to the right in yellow, that is a neighbor's property. There is an empty lot behind that property that goes straight into the street behind it. You're going to hear from one of the tenants of that yellow building who lived towards the back. A week before 
the defendant broke into Amy Harwood's home, she installed two ring cameras in the back portion of that building. That's the home with the vacant lot in the back. Before we get to that, just to place the chronology here, the defendant finds her phone on January 17th. Amy blocks the defendant, and for the next few weeks, there is no contact. The defendant's not able to contact Amy Harwood until we get to Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, Amy goes out with her girlfriends, and she's going to go out to downtown Los Angeles. And she leaves her home sometime around 7 p.m. Right around the same time, like around 7, 10 p.m., defendant is texting Natasha Paulson. You're going to hear from Natasha Paulson, who will provide copies of her text messages in which she's having conversations with the defendant. Uh, and the defendant's texting her uh, about, oh, that's totally fine, busy woman, I'm good, just also trying to get everything under the sun. So this is at 7, 10 p.m. on the date of the murder. On the date he's going to break into her home. The defendant's residence is in Playa del Rey, about 51 miles from Amy Harwick's home. Amy Harwick's home in the Hollywood Hills on Mound Street is 286. The vacant lot is right behind 2078 Mound Street. That's what the back of that lot looks like. So the next video is, we're going to present it in evidence, it's to show you what those two locations look like. Uh, Amy's home and the neighbor's home and the location of the ring cameras. The ring cameras, as the people will present evidence of this, will be significant because they will show the defendant. And in the videos, that we expect to be shown to you, the defendant will be wearing gloves. So this now shows, that's the first camera that's on a pole. And here's a better look at that particular ring video. hear evidence that when you pull down a ring camera down for several seconds, it shuts off and then it resets itself again. Second camera, just a few feet ahead. And the time of these, when this is being done on the camera, is going to show at 8.52 p.m. Then there's another video at 8.53 where the defendant appears to be coming back towards one of the ring cameras. At this point, Michael Herman is in his bedroom on the bottom level. He is asleep, tired. And around this time, after 8.53 p.m., past 9 p.m., he hears what sounds to him like someone dropping a dish or something breaking. He's going to tell you that he thought he thought Amy was at home and that she had dropped something. So he didn't think much of it. Well, detectives will later find, as they will testify to this, that the French doors had glass broken. Photographs were taken of the condition of the French doors, which were broken. And they had criminalists, after this crime occurred, go and take swabs if they found any type of evidence there. And what they found were 
these smears of blood on the French doors. You're going to hear from criminals who collected swabs from this blood, what appeared to them to be blood, and it was tested, and it came back to defendant's DNA. There was one more blood stain on the floor, and that was also tested, and that came back to defendant's DNA. You're going to hear evidence that when defendant broke into her home, that on his person he had a syringe with a brown liquid that the will tell you originally they didn't know what it was. That will be, after it's tested by chemists, by the FBI, that's uh, pure nicotine in a pure form. It's a poison. You're going to hear from one of our experts on nicotine who will tell you that was a lethal dose of nicotine that if injected into Amy, Amy Harvick, it would kill her. Well, while the defendant is waiting there at the home, Michael Herman is still asleep. I want to show you what the upper level of this home looks like. There's a staircase from the second floor from the living room that leads up to the third floor. On the third floor, you're gonna have two rooms and a bathroom. Towards the bottom of this, what's shown here, you're gonna have the TV room, otherwise known as the media room. Then you're gonna have a bathroom and a hallway in between that room and Amy Harwick's bedroom. And then you're gonna have the balcony and over to the left is her walk-in closet. So Amy is with her friends at this time. She's enjoying her evening, but then she's going to get leave her friends at about 12.30 a.m. You're going to hear from her friends in this case. And she arrives home and parks her car in her driveway and sends a text message at 1.02 a.m. to Sarah Rollins. Send me the pics on the green couch, which she sent at 2.05 a.m. Amy Harmick will not get to see you, this text message, as evidence will show. So after sending that text at 1.02 a.m., Amy Harwick makes her way into her home. But as evidence will show, even officers who appeared at the scene when they were there that night missed the damage to the French doors. It wasn't readily visible as you go in through that front door. At that time, at around 1.02 a.m. that night, Amy Harwick, when she entered, her bedroom was 38 years old. Defendant Garrett Purcell was 41 years old. She was 5 foot 5. Defendant was 6 foot 4. She weighed about 118 pounds. And he weighed about 230 pounds. So there is no video uh, of what happened on that third floor, but the circumstantial evidence that we will present in this case will show you that her jacket was found in that media room. The necklace she wore that night was broken and in the corner of that media room. That Michael Herman will testify that he started, he woke up to her scream and to her being thrown down to the ground. Or what sounded to him like someone was being thrown down to the ground. From the staircase, he yelled out, hey, motherfucker, leave her alone. He didn't know what was happening. He's going to tell you that he didn't know if someone had a gun or what did they have. And that in a panic, and he wanted to go get help. And he ran to the side of the home to go get help. He actually jumped over the gate that was locked and cut himself. And about... So this is six minutes after that text message from Amy Harwick that Michael Herman is knocking on the neighbor's door. You're going to hear, and I apologize for having to show you this us, but this is some of the, the coroner's going to testify regarding some of these injuries that 
Amy Harwick sustained injuries consistent with manual strangulation, which was also a contributing factor to her death. She also had assaultive injuries. Injuries on her neck, particularly strap muscle, hemorrhage are consistent with manual strangulation. Injuries of her extremities, particularly her fingers and hands, are consistent with the combination of defense and assault type wounds, suggestive of, of an altercation. Also, in that hallway between the media room and her bedroom, the first officers that arrived uh, found what appeared to them to be a pool of urine. You're going to hear that her fingernails were swabbed later on and tested to see if there was any DNA there. And DNA came back to this defendant, Derek Persos, as you will hear in this case. The circumstantial evidence that we will present to you will show that uh, Amy Harwood was in a debilitated state after she had been strangled and assaulted, and that now her roommate had yelled out. And at this point, the evidence will show that the defendant panicked, dragged her body to the balcony, opened the door with whatever blood he had on his uh, gloves from having hit Amy Harwick, took her to the balcony and threw her body over that three-story balcony. The evidence will also show that a syringe was dropped right there at that balcony. I'll talk a little bit about, more, more about that a little bit later. The cause of death, as the coroner will testify, is, as I've said, uh, severe damage, severe trauma from that fall, including uh, damage to the brain, damage to the liver, the pelvis, and including manual strangulation. And the evidence will show that as Amy's body lay there on the concrete, the kitchen door would be left open as officers would see and there would be a path for the defendant to climb right back from where he came, as a video that we will present in this case will show, back to those ring camera videos. And that ring camera video that we will present to you in this case will be triggered at 1.11 a.m., about nine minutes after Amy's last test. Michael Herman will testify that he heard her screaming, that he knew she was being attacked and heard her thrown to the ground. And he says that you he see anything? On the no. Okay, so no, I, heard, I heard her screaming and I heard her being... All right, so I'm going to send out that somebody's screaming, okay? Since you didn't see anything. You don't know if she's being attacked yes. or you're not sure. Yes, right. I know she's being attacked. I've heard about thrown to the ground. I'm, I'm... Okay, all right. So 2086 Mount Street. Is it a house yes. or an apartment, sir? It's a house. Okay. And is it, who's screaming inside? Um, I can't even think right now. Um, Amy, Amy Carlin. I mean, who is she to you, sir? Fifteen. She's my roommate. Okay. Twenty. And she's screaming for help? One, twelve. Yes. Okay. All right, and your name? One, Michael Herman. Zero, seconds. And what is your callback number, Michael? Um, I don't have my phone. This is somebody else's phone. Okay, would it be okay to contact you back at this phone? Zero, one, yeah. seven, Okay. Eight, All right. Ten, seconds. All right. And so you're also hearing somebody hitting her? Is that correct? Yes, I heard something like that, yes. That's, uh, that's evidence we'll present here of the one call when Michael Herman testified at that 1.14 a.m. Uh, around this time, we'll also present evidence back to Natasha Paulson, uh, who was previously texting with the defendant. Defendant, at about 1.57 a.m., texts her back. Ha ha, that's funny, related to some comment she had made. So this is 46 minutes after the defendant has left Amy who texts this woman back. Uh, ha, ha, ha. That's funny. Later that morning, on February 15, 2020, the defendant texts another woman, Angelique Judice, who will testify in this case. And he texts her at about 10.59 a.m., less than 11 hours since he left Amy. Morning, sunshine. Angela Judice will testify to the text messaging that was going on between them. And that she actually went over to his home at his invitation and then stayed there 
for several hours until he was arrested later that afternoon. Investigation. You're going to see body worn video of how officers arrived at the scene within a few minutes. And it's going to be graphic video of uh, Amy Harwick on the ground in her condition. Um, she appeared unconscious. She was pointed to seizure. And there will be evidence presented to you of that. Uh, Michael Herman will testify that he immediately told officers about Amy's fear of the defendant. Amy would later be transported to Cedar Sinai, where she, where she would be pronounced dead. Friends, several friends of Amy Harwick identified Garrett Pershaw as a suspect she feared. Detectives obtained the neighbor's ring camera, and detectives collect Amy's phone and evidence from the crime scene. You're going to hear from these detectives who will testify as to the evidence they collected. At 4.45 p.m. later that <coughs> afternoon, the defendant is arrested. He's in the company of Angeli Judice, who he has spent several hours with. Photographs are taken of the defendant later that day. And he has several injuries throughout his body, including uh, bruising to what appears to be the knee and cuts on the knee and some bruising, some fresh bruising to, toward the bicep. Search of the defendant's residence reveals a syringe with the same brand as the syringe left behind at the crime scene. And there'll be other items at that home that we'll discuss during the trial. The detectives are able to obtain the defendant's cell phone, but in his cell phone, they are not able to find any of the messages that he sent to Amy Hart. A few days later, after Amy Harwood has passed away, her friend Robert Koshland is going through her things to collect them for her family. He finds several journals, and in some of those journals, he finds a password for her Gmail account. He goes into her Gmail account with that password and finds that email that Amy wrote to herself. And there's one last paragraph that I want to that we will present to you from that letter, which states, I'm pretty nervous, this is the end of, of her letter. I'm pretty nervous that I'm more on his radar now. It terrifies me that he has been obsessed with me for nine years, thinks of me every day, can't move on, cries and throws tantrums in this way. He is and focus on harming me. However, I'm hoping that this interaction and the listening and giving him time may cause neutralization in his anger towards me. This is back on January 17, 2020. Lastly, this is my last slide, ladies and gentlemen. This is my second to last slide. Detectives try to get that, so the liquid in that syringe tested. And you're going to hear testimony that they sent it to the LAPD labs and they're not able to first determine what that is. It's not a controlled substance, I meaning it's not a methamphetamine, heroin, what have you. You can even hear in the body worn video some officers who found it that night, that morning, thinking that it's heroin. They had to send the liquid from that syringe to the FBI to have a more comprehensive test. And there, the FBI determined that it was nicotine in a pure form. Then you're going to hear from our expert, Dr. Benowitz, who's going to tell you. That amount of nicotine in that pure form, if injected into Amy Harwood, would have killed. You're also going to hear uh, that that particular poison is not readily detectable, as it wasn't for the LAPD. At the end of this case, I want you to hear all the evidence in this case and everything the defense has to say. At the end of this case, People are going to ask you to come back with a verdict of guilty as to the residential burglary, the murder of Amy Harwick, and the special circumstance of laying in wait during the commission of this murder. Thank you. All right, thank you, Counsel. Mr. Franjo. Thank you, Officer. We have 10 seconds for a quick uh, moving first. Sure. Still camera.
so much I need to say. Please give me a chance to just say it. So I could have just said it. Please. Please. Can we meet again? It feels the same as when I wrote you. That long list of what I would miss about you and heard nothing back. Just reaching out into the darkness, trying to stop falling. I wish I could do something more, but reaching out to you is a crippling action that I had actually contemplated over the past few months. Just to say to you the word help. Admitting to you how hurt I am is so embarrassing and painful which demolishes me even more. Please don't vanish on me. Please, please, don't let me go through that again. Please call me. These are the messages that Gareth Pursehouse sends Amy Harwick after unexpectedly running into her after having not seen her for nearly eight years. Running into her out of the blue, on January 16, 2020, sent him into a deep, debilitating depression that he was not able to overcome. He was begging with her for help. He was begging and pleading her, pleading with her for a chance to talk to her. The evidence will show that running into her at that event sent him into a, a thick fog of depression and made him feel that the only way he could get relief from that pain was to go to talk to her. The ultimate answer that you, ladies and gentlemen, are, are asked, sorry, the ultimate question that you will be asked to answer is what Garrett Kershaus intended to do when he broke into her house on the 14th of February in 2020. The evidence will show that he was reacting from within this fog of depression and that he was going to talk to her. That his only intention that night was to speak to her. The evidence will show that he never intended on killing her. The evidence will show that he is not guilty of first degree premeditated murder and he is not guilty for the special circumstance of lying in wait. Amy Pursehouse, sorry, Amy Harwick and Garrett Pursehouse had a romantic relationship from 2009, uh, this began in 2009. They lived together for a little over a year until sometime in 2011. When they split up, Garrett Pursehouse was never the same. Losing Amy Harwick sent him into a debilitating, crushing depression. It made it hard for him to function. He even lost a job that he had at the time because of that. The heartbreak that he suffered changed him. He tried to move past it, but he couldn't. He tried to move alongside it by seeking uh, release through exercise, travel, dating other women, but those were only temporary respites. Those didn't work. He distanced himself from other people. He wouldn't let himself become emotionally vulnerable with other women. He had suffered, the, the, the threshold had been reached of his heartbreak, and he couldn't risk another one who wouldn't survive it. So when he sees Amy Harwick on the red carpet, or waiting for the red carpet, uh, at an event that he had been working for many years as a side gig, photographing attendees at this award ceremony that happens every year in downtown Los Angeles, he completely loses control of his emotions. He literally falls to the floor. And he's hyperventilating, he's sobbing, he's shaking. And with Amy's encouragement, he's able to stand up. And the two of them 
walk off and talk, to sit down on a bench, and he's able, through talking to her, to regain his composure. After about 30 or 40 minutes, uh, Miss Harwick's friend, who she came to the event with, Fernando Chavez, comes up to the two of them and says, hey, the red carpet's about to close. If we want to get pictures on the red carpet, we have to go. And so he cuts the conversation short. And to him, it seemed like Gareth was uh, disappointed and upset at having the conversation cut short. Gareth goes and finds his friends that were at the event. You'll hear from them who will say that he seemed distraught, that he was sobbing uncontrollably, that it was pathetic how sad he was from their perspective, and that they told him to pull himself together. He was on the clock. He was being paid to photograph people there that night, and they tried to help him. Later that night, Gareth walks up to the table that Fernando Chavez and Amy Harwick were seated at during the program of the event. He kneels down and he whispers, can we talk again tonight? Amy says, okay. Uh, shortly thereafter, the two of them go back and sit back down on the bench and talk again a second time. At some point in the conversation, after about 45 minutes, Ms. Harwick tells Gareth, look, I have, to go, I have to go meet my friend, Fernando Chavez, I have to go. He asks if they can meet again, continue talking. She says that's not a good idea. The next day, the 17th, the text messages that I read in the very beginning uh, are sent by Gareth to Amy. He's pleading with her. Please, I need to talk to you again. I need to continue this conversation. The following day, on the 18th, at about 4 p.m., he leaves for this voicemail. I have so much I need to say. Please give me a chance to just say it so I can upset it. Please. Ms. Harwick didn't respond to his pleas for help. She blocked his number. In the days after this encounter, a friend of Gareth's notices that he seems depressed, Elmira Minnesota. To her, it seems that uh, he's down, he's depressed, and so she asks him, are you okay? He says, I'm rarely okay. He describes his state of mind as if he was having a chain pulling down on him. That he likes to, or that he pretends doesn't exist, but that cripples him in so many ways in life. Ms. Menasaka is concerned. Ms. Menasaka is concerned that he might hurt himself. Ms. Menasaka suggests things that he could do to try to alleviate this pain and, and get, get over this heartbreak and move past this depression. But because of the depth of depression that he was in and the state of mind that he was in, the only thing that he felt he could do in that moment to seek any sort of release from this, from this depression was to talk to Amy. So on February 14th, he decided he couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't take this pain anymore. Well, Jeff, argument. This is good. <clears throat> the evidence will show, and circumstantial evidence 
text messages, voicemails, observations from other people will show that Derek felt he couldn't continue living with this pain and that the, he needed to finish the conversation that had been interrupted at the Expos Awards and that he needed to have this conversation that he so desperately and so uh, kind of sadly begged her for. And that if he wasn't able to have this conversation, that it wasn't worth living, that he wouldn't be able to continue carrying on. I'm going to check foundation and, and sustain. While in this grip of utter despair, he grabs a nicotine filled syringe from his house. All right, let, 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 let's approach. As Mr. Agatha said in his opening argument, there is evidence that Mr. Firsthouse possessed a syringe, brought it from his house, and brought it to Ms. Harvick's house. You will hear testimony from the officers who searched the house that they found it on the balcony, and they, they found it still with its cap on and still with liquid inside. One reason, this is a piece of circumstantial evidence that you will hear a lot about later on in this trial now is not the time to get into. But this is a piece of circumstantial evidence. One reasonable inference of him bringing the syringe to her house and inside of her house is that he intended to kill her. Another reasonable inference is that he brought it intending to kill himself. The circumstantial evidence, the messages he sent, the, me the voicemail he left, the observations of other people uh, at the ex visit awards, the observations of Ms. Nanasaka, will show that he was in a depressed state of mind. Now, he breaks into her house in this state of mind, and he is waiting there for hours so that he can have this conversation. When Miss Harvick comes home, there is a struggle. As Mr. Ariel said, Michael Herman is her uh, housemate. He lives in a room that's on the ground floor. It has a door out to the balcony. And he wakes up to a scream. He wakes up to what he thinks is Amy Harvick screaming. At first, he thinks it's the kind of scream that you would make when you see like a mouse or a cockroach or something. But then he realizes, no, no, it, she's continuing to scream. So he gets out of bed and he walks over or goes over to the foot of the stairs and he shouts up once, Amy! He continues to hear sounds. So he goes into his room and looks for his keys and his phone, which he can't find. He's continuing to hear sounds from above, and he goes back to the foot of the stairs, and he shouts up in uh, up the upward direction, uh, up towards 
her room on the top floor. Hey, motherfucker! And then he runs out through the patio, around the side of the house, through the front courtyard area. And because he couldn't find his keys and his phone, he has to climb up and over this, this wrought iron fence. He goes and he knocks on neighbors' doors, trying to get help, but no one, no one opens their doors. He eventually sees a stranger walking down the street, and he asks the stranger to use his phone. The stranger calls 911, and the police arrive. Two officers arrive after a brief discussion with Mr. Herman. The three of them climb up and over the wrought iron fence. They go back this, down the side of the house, and when they round the corner, into the patio area, they see Miss Harley. She's face down. Uh, she's a non-responsive, gravely injured, but still alive. She's beneath the balcony, which is a little over, the, the, the floor of the balcony is a little over 20 feet above the patio where Miss Harley was found. And, you know, they take Miss Harley to Cedar Sinai where doctors try to save her life and are unsuccessful. And she tragically passes away that night. You're going to hear from Dr. Scott Luzzi, who performed the autopsy. And he is going to uh, testify that he forms an opinion as to the cause of death. And that the cause of death that he um, opined based on his autopsy was blunt force trauma to the head and torso. That he also found evidence of manual strangulation, and he also found evidence of an altercation with injuries consistent with def defensive and assaultive wounds. You're also going to hear from uh, forensic scientist Bob Malik. He is a uh, accident reconstructionist, and he's going to testify that he performed uh, a fall analysis that he uh, used what's called finite analysis uh, to look at the possible ways uh, in which Ms. Harwick could have arrived in the location that she was at. He's going to talk about the investigation that he did of the scene. He's going to talk about the, uh, all of the video, photographs, and documents that he reviewed of the police investigation. He's going to talk about how uh, there, how one can use mathematical equations <coughs> and scientific principles um, based on physics and biomechanics to look at the parameters of where someone came to rest and look at their center of mass and their location and orientation um, and relationship to the things that are in that space such as, in this case, the balcony, the awning, uh, the house, to uh, identify the possible starting points that could have resulted in, uh, in her place of rest. And you're going to hear from Mr. Mallet that he was able to exclude a number of scenarios, and he was able to identify uh, a number of possible scenarios, two of which are likely. And you're going to hear from Mr. Malik that one of those likely scenarios is that she was hanging from the outside of the balcony. Objection. No, but the, the court stated that uh, it would allow the possible scenarios. Possible scenarios. Go ahead. Right. You'll hear this in great detail from his testimony, it, how he excluded certain scenarios how he arrived at other scenarios, and from within those, whittled down the scenarios to what are likely based on the science. And one of them is that she was hanging using these mannequin dummies like this, and then you also see um, a video representation that corresponds with the calculations and analysis that we did. And you'll see um, 
you know, you'll hear from him and explain the, the foundation and basis for this, but he'll explain how uh, one of the likely scenarios is that uh, she was gripping the balcony railing with either one or two feet using the awning to brace her weight and fell from that position. You're also going to see a photograph of damage to the awning. Um, beneath and kind of recessed under the balcony. It's kind of hard to tell there, but there you'll also see a close-up image that shows damage to the front side of the awning in a, in a location consistent with where somebody would place their foot to brace their weight. You're also going to see in this trial uh, this photograph, a photo shoot she did where she's posing here on the balcony. And this is not shown for purposes of uh, the clothing she's wearing or anything like that. But you'll see that uh, she had a certain comfort level with the balcony railing. You'll hear that she was an athletic, acrobatic person, and that for years she was a dancer. So, in this trial, you will hear testimony and you will see evidence presented before you that shows you that one likely scenario for how Ms. Harwick came to rest where she did in the patio is that she comes home, encounters Mr. Pursehouse, screams, waking up Michael Herman, causing him to go to the foot of the stairs. He shouts up at them. Upon hearing him shouting up, a struggle occurs between Ms. Harwick and Mr. Pursehouse. In a panic, she runs through her bedroom to her balcony, climbs up and over the railing, attempts to lower herself or climb down, and is unsuccessful and falls. The evidence will show that, yes, Garrett Pursehouse was waiting in her home. He broke into her home. Had he not been there, she wouldn't have died that night. That is not in dispute. He set a chain of actions into motion that led to her death. But the evidence will show that he never intended on killing her. At the end of this trial, the defense is going to ask you to convict him of a crime that fits the circumstances and facts of this case. But the evidence will show that he is not guilty of first degree premeditated murder and that he is not guilty of the special circumstance of lying in rape. Thank you. All right, thank you, counsel. Are you prepared to call your first witness, counsel? Uh, yes. You may. We'll call Rebecca Kimbaugh. All right. Yes. Yes, if you could raise your right hand, face the gentleman here. Oh, here. 
You saw the state that the testimony you're about to give is a cause not pending before this court to be the truth. I hope you're going to bring up the truth of the guy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Kimbach, R E B E C C A K I E M B O C K. Thank you. How old are you, Ms. Kimbach? 30 years old. I want to draw your attention back to the date of February 14, 2020. Uh, prior to that date, did you live at 2078 Mound Street? In the Hollywood Hills. Yes. We're going to have here an area of photograph depicting 2086 Mound Street and 2070, 2078 Mound Street. This is Mark. People in order, number one. Number one. Yeah. Photograph, right? Yeah. Yes. All right, Mark. See that aerial photograph there? Yes. You see what it says? Uh, 2078 on Mound Street? Yes. Is that, does that depict where you used to live back then in 2020? Correct. And what part of the building did you live? I lived uh, on the lower level, on the left side. So 2078, right there, just down the stairs. And what was behind uh, where you lived? What was behind your property? An empty lot. You want to have a period photograph of what appears to be an empty lot. This we mark people next in order, number two. Yes. Can you hear at people's number two? Can you tell us what is shown there? That is the empty lot, um, and through the gate up more uh, brambles up to where I used to live. And the bottom part of this photograph appears to show some concrete. Uh, is that the street? Uh, uh, I'm assuming so. I never went down there. But the lot is empty from your home all the way down to where that concrete area is. Yes. I'm going to show you a photograph depicting what appears to be the front of that location. Looking here at next in order, Your Honor, photograph. Here at three. Equals three. Do you recognize <coughs> what is shown there? Yes, that's my carport on the right. And on the left is my neighbor's house. Looking here at another photograph. Uh, depicting what appears to be a walkway. And this we mark people's next in order, people's number four. four. Yes. He tells us what is shown here. Uh, this is the side of the house, and if you follow down uh, the stairs on the left, you get to my front door, and that door up the stairs there is the shared laundry room. So what I'm pointing to right now on this photograph right in the middle appears to be a, uh, a door like French door style, uh, what would that be? That's the laundry room. And looking here at another photograph depicting a different door, may this be marked as people's number five? Yes. Looking here at people's number five, can you tell us what is shown there? Uh, that is my front door, the steps. Now going back to people's number four, this photograph showing the laundry room and what appears to be, uh, would this be going towards the back of your home? Uh, this would be going to the back of the home. Looking at people's, another photograph showing, uh, it's a photograph of that walkway going more towards the back. And this we mark people's next in order, number six. Yes. Looking at people's six. You tell us what is shown there. That is the stairs and gate um, that leads to my front door. Uh, I'm going to bring this photograph over to you. Does this photograph show any cameras that you installed? Uh, very faintly, you can see the camera. Uh, that is drilled into the fence on the left. I'm going to bring, with the court permission, may I bring this yes. up to the uh, witness? Uh, using this pen, can you just draw a pretty good circle around where there's a camera there? That's 
that's on people six. People six. Okay. I'm gonna zoom in. You can have people six. Did you draw a circle? Um, something that appears to be on the wood fence to the left? Yes. And can you tell the jury what is that? That is a ring camera. And prior to uh, February 15, 2020, uh, about how much time before that date approximately did you install that ring camera? One week. And how many ring cameras did you install? Three. Uh, looking here at another photograph showing another location towards the back of your building, the District of People's Next in Order, People's Number Seven. Seven. <coughs> over to you and ask you, do, well, first of all, do you see a camera on that photograph? Yes. Can you, using people's number seven, draw a circle for that second camera? <coughs> you refer, just write your initials next to it. Okay. For the record, Your Honor, she's on people's number seven. She's drawn a circle and her initials. It appears to be some kind of wood beam. Is that correct? Yes. And were all your cameras installed about a week before uh, February 15, 2020? Yes, they were all installed the same day. And on February 15, 2020, did some, where were you? I was in Joshua Tree. And were you with anyone in particular? I was with my ex-boyfriend. And while you were there on February 15, 2020, did something happen? Uh, yes, I received uh, several calls from my landlord at around 7.30 on February 14, uh, 15th, 15th. And who's your landlord? Uh, Damian Montano. And where does Damian Montano, where was he living at that time? He lived uh, above me, upstairs. So did he live uh, closer to the street, Mount Street? Yes. And so uh, what did he tell you? Um, on the 15th, he called me and asked me if my cameras caught anything. He didn't specify. Objection here, sir. Well, let me just state, is it, it, it is based on what he asked you, did you undertake subsequent conduct? Is that what you're introducing it for? Yes. Did you undertake uh, subsequent conduct after he asked you that question? Did you, did you do something as a result of that question? Uh, as a result of yes, the yes. Yes, okay, the overruled court will allow it. And what did you do? I checked my phone okay. for notifications to see if I had any motion detected from my ring cameras. And did you have any motion detected? Yes. And about how many uh, videos did you have that showed uh, that something had triggered your cameras? Uh, four videos, four uh, four notifications I received. And now, are these notifications time stamped? Yes, they are. And uh, to your knowledge, when you installed the ring cameras, did you verify whether the time stamp was accurate? Yes. And how did you do that? Uh, a friend and myself, we tested the cameras and spoke through them to see just how um, quickly I could hear, just to see the accuracy. And did it appear that the time stamp was accurate? Yes. <laughs> Your Honor, I have in my hand a DVD uh, labeled 2078 Mound Street, four videos, date February 14, 2020 and February 15, 2020. May this be marked People's Next in Good. Order. Good eight. Eight, thank you. Now, uh, what did you do with these uh, four videos from your ring cameras? I uh, emailed them to the police that were at my house when I returned from Joshua Tree. At about what time did you return to jo uh, from Joshua Tree to your home? I believe it was around 11.30 or so, and I emailed at 2.45 around then. Uh, when you say 11.30, you mean 11.30 in the morning on February 15th? Yes. And then later on, uh, you said at 2.45 you emailed them to uh, detectives? Yes. And why did you do that? Uh, because they were requesting the videos. 
Now I'm going to show you uh, one of the video clips, the first one labeled no, 2051, uh, meaning 851, and ask you if you recognize what's depicted here. triggered on your phone. Yes. And, and when you when I say trigger, what happens on your phone when someone uh, uh, triggers one of your ring cameras? I get a notification. And when you, when you looked at this video, the time, uh, was there anything to you to indicate that the time would not be accurate? No. And we're looking at another video with the title 2052.42, meaning 8.52 p.m. Do you recognize this video? Yes. How so? Uh, it was also another notification I received. And uh, as far as these ring cameras, what happens? Have you ever done that? What's been, what, what we see here being done to your camera when someone covers it? Do you know what happens to that, to the camera? I believe that it stops the motion and stops recording. Objection, foundation, and speculation. Uh, I sustain at this point. You say you believe. What makes you believe that? Motion, motion is straight it's stricken, so counsel, go ahead. Okay. Uh, have you ever tried doing that to the camera? No. Uh, have you seen anyone else do that to the camera? No. Uh, have you ever had anyone uh, cover your cameras in that way? No. Objection relevance, 352. Oh, oh. <laughs> Did you recognize the person that was in, in those videos? No. Did you ever give that person permission to enter your property. Objection relevance. Oh, uh -huh. You can answer that. No. Did you ever give that person permission to cover up your cameras? No. You want me to uh, play a video clip titled 2053, meaning 8.53 p.m. Let me ask, let me know if you recognize this video clip. previous tests of the cameras. How would you test the camera? Uh, when I first installed them, my friend and I spoke to each other through <coughs> the camera and my phone. It was as though we were FaceTiming. It was exact. Okay, let me play the final video clip, which is uh, titled 0111, meaning 111 in the morning.
so if your camera's not covered, it will continue to record. Yes. Objection foundation. Sustained based on our previous answer. Motion is right. Well, I'm just saying based on the video that we've seen. Well, we're stricken. Well, that, that video, no one blocked it. That the court will note. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. If you will, please. Thank you. may continue your examination. Well, you may continue your examination. I have no further questions. All right, uh, cross-examination, who's doing it here? Um, no one, Your Honor. We have no questions. No questions. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down, please. You may call your next witness. Yes, the people call Dr. Hernando Chavez. Yeah. All right. Uh, obviously, Monday's a holiday, right? Uh, I just I forgot all about that. So yes. And tomorrow, uh, normally 9:30, 9:40. I have a doctor's appointment at eight. I should be, I, I, I. You get uh, approach the witness stand down here, please. I'll ask you to face uh, my clerk. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly state that the testimony you're about to give and the cause now pending before this court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help of God? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Please state and spell both your first and last name. My name is Fernando Chavez. H E R N A N D O C H A V E S. All right, Mr. Chavez. Dr. Chavez, I'm going to show you a photograph. This can be marked people's number nine. Nine, yes. Photograph of a woman. You see that there? Yes. Do you recognize who's depicted in that photograph? Yes, I do. And who is that? That's Dr. Amy Harwick. And what was Dr. Amy Harwick to you? Uh, she was a friend and colleague. And prior to 2020, how long had you known her? We've known each other approximately 10 years. How did you meet? Uh, we met in a professional capacity initially. She had reached out to me uh, because she was a newer therapist and I was a therapist who had um, a practice and a supervisor and sort of established in Los Angeles. So she reached out for networking purposes. Did you and her go to the same school? Yes, we did, but at different times. Did she obtain a doctorate at that particular school? 
She did, yes. I, uh, doctor, just keep your voice up a little. I want all the jurors to hear if you would. Sure. Speak into the microphone if you would. As for the last question, Your Honor, object, objection to your say. Well, which is? The, Let me look at the question here. I'll, I'll overrule. Answer stands. Uh, did you obtain your doctorate from the same school? Yes, I did. And was a doctorate in what? Human sexuality. And did Ms. Harwood, to your knowledge, also obtain her doctorate in that particular field? Yes, she did. You mentioned that she was a therapist. Yes. Uh, what type of therapist was she? She was a licensed marriage and family therapist. And what does that mean? Objection to foundation. Oh. What type of therapist are you? I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Tell the jury, what, what does that mean? Uh, licensed therapists are overseen by the Board of Behavioral Sciences in California, um, where they make sure that th those who are within their organization of being licensed have the education, training, and experience to obtain a license and therefore for the public um, be seen as licensed therapists. I'm going to ask you to speak a little louder so, so the jurors back here can hear you. Sure. And prior to 2020, uh, did you and, and Dr. Amy Harwick, uh, would you meet in a professional capacity? Yes. And how so? Various ways. Um, we would meet for coffee or have phone calls where we would have case consultations. It's a part of our profession to reach out for support with ther with therapy clients. Um, it's a standard, uh, an ethical standard that we are obliged to. Uh, we would also go to conferences together, um, attend workshops together, and events that were related to our license and our CE units, which are necessary for us to renew licensure. Uh, did you practice, practice therapy with Dr. Howard, or did she have her own practice? She had her own practice. Your Honor, do we need the photo up? Can we what? Do we need the photo up? Well, that's a, 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 yeah, you, it's a, not a problem. Um, speaking of Dr. Harwick, uh, prior to 2020, Did you work uh, with the adult and entertainment industry in your capacity as a therapist? Yes. Relevance. Well, overrule. I take it foundational. Yes. Okay. Overrule. You can answer that. Yes. How so? I would do advocacy work within the adult industry, both political advocacy and mental health advocacy. What does that mean, mental health? Uh, to try and bring resources to the adult industry community, which for, uh, as a marginalized community, they oftentimes don't have support systems that are in place for, uh, to meet their needs. And was there, was there any particular group that you belonged to back in 2020 that would do something? One of the main mental health supports right now in the adult industry is called Pineapple Support. And did you belong to that group? Uh, I was adjacently supporting them. Um, I did not list myself under their website because I had a friendship with their president and vice president, so I found it to be a conflict of interest to accept clients from them. However, I did support them through donations and also seeking out additional therapists that you know, sort of have human sexuality training and can uh, you know, be beneficial for their organization, for their nonprofit. Did Dr. Amy Howard, did she belong to that organization? Yes, she was listed under their website as a pineapple support therapist. And what does that mean? Uh, it's a therapist that has been vetted by the organization to um, make sure that it meets the needs of having uh, sex education, human sexuality training, and a affirmative view of the adult industry so that they aren't, you know, clients aren't exposed to people who may be judgmental or um, harmful to these clients. Objection foundation as to the vetting by the organization that he's not a part of. And uh, as part of that group, would you invite it? to anything uh, around January of 2020? Yes. And what was that? Uh, in various capacities, different conferences and different workshops. Um, so I had given suicide awareness presentations on behalf of Pineapple Support. I had done workshops around boundaries and mental health support for Pineapple Support. They also would... Um, well, I don't, I don't want to okay. labor this, but did you get invited to something? Yes, I was invited to the XBiz conference and awards.
And was anyone else invited? Uh, Dr. Amy Hart was also. And uh, did you attend any conference? Was, uh, was there an award show at the end of these conferences on January 16, 2020? Yes. And prior to that, were there some conferences at the same location? Yes. And what location was that? Uh, this was at the Andaz Hotel in uh, on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood was where the workshops were from Monday through Thursday. And then Thursday evening, they had a, an awards ceremony that was uh, in downtown LA at the JW Marriott at LA Live. And did you attend any of the conferences uh, before the awards night? I did not. Uh, do you know if Amy Harwick attend, Dr. Amy Harwick attended any of the conferences? Yes, she did attend and was also a speaker in a panel. Now, if you uh, are part of this group or you present at a conference, uh, do you get invited to the awards show? Yes. And did you get invited to the awards show? Yes. And did, to your knowledge, did Dr. Amy Harwick get invited to this awards show on January 16th? Yes. And, and did you and her plan to attend the awards show together? Yes. And how did that happen? Our initial plan was to meet up together and she would drive us to downtown LA. We both lived near Hollywood. Um, and then our plan was to then go our separate ways as she had different plans afterwards. She was going to go to a burlesque show to take pictures of a friend because she had a passion for photography. Let me get this straight. So uh, the plan, so as you were concerned, was you would meet with Amy Harwick, go to the x -Biz Awards, and later on she would go to a different show. Yes. And well, did you and her go together to the x -Biz Awards show on January 16, 2020? Yes, we did. And how did you get there? Uh, I Ubered to her house, and she drove us both to downtown LA to the Marriott. And when you say you Ubered to her house, is this the house located at 2086 Mount Street in the Hollywood Hills? Yes, it is. And uh, what kind of car was she driving back then? She was driving a two-door sports car, kind of dark, um, maybe a Scion or um, something sporty. And uh, did you and her drive to downtown LA to the awards show? Yes. And how would you describe her demeanor as you're going to the show? Very excited. She was thrilled. Why would you say that? Um, she has heard me tell stories about um, the industry, and this was her first event, the, the, her first awards show, and I, and I had been to previously to a number of them. She was also excited about the red carpet. Um, having a history of being a model, she loved the red carpet, she loved taking photos, and she was very excited about um, walking the runway. The red carpet, excuse me. How would you describe her demeanor at that point before getting to the award show? Very talkative, very excited, energized, um, talking about the different people she wanted to meet, um, and we kind of devised our own little plan of trying to meet different folks that she was uh, wanted to connect the network with. You're going to have uh, another uh, document that has seven pages, all photographs. Uh, next to mark people's next in order, page number 10. A through? Uh, pages a 1 through? Well, we'll make them A, we'll the letters. Uh, uh, it'll be 10, people's 10, A through. I could just have one more? Yes. Expos Awards we attended together, and that is the red carpet. And how long was this red carpet? Probably you mean the event or the, whole, no, the no, actual the, carpet? The length, the length of the red carpet. Look. About 20 yards. Okay. And uh, did anything happen when, while you were at the red carpet? Um, when we arrived, we initially got in line because we ran a few minutes late and she was excited about uh, those pictures on the red carpet. There was about 40 people in line, so we knew it was going to be a long wait. Um, so we immediately went to the line, uh, and that's, that was our first uh, as we walked in. And 
looking at page two of this exhibit. It's uh, B. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, uh, B yes. uh, equals 10. Can you tell us what is shown here? That is the walkway. So if to the right of that photo is the red carpet, and this is to the left of it, and it's this walkway between the ballroom and the red carpet. So in that walkway, there are a number of drink stations and doors that lead into the ballroom. So on either side, you have the red carpet to the right and the ballroom to the left. This is from the <coughs> opposite side of the line. And did anything happen at this point? Um, at, so when we arrived, the first thing we did as we were in line, um, I had a few friends who were right in front of us. I took a drink order. I said, I want to buy everybody a drink and took the order. And once I got that order, I walked down this path that, that's listed and I got in line for the bar. This question was, did anything happen? I, but I, uh, if it's okay, Your Honor, I think this is an explanation. So you want, you want a chronological order, uh, explanation? Yes. All right, sure. Uh, uh, so then you went to the bar to get this drink order. And where did you leave Amy when you went to the bar? She was in line with the friends that I had that we had met that we found there. So she was with other people. And how long were you at the bar area before something happened? Approximately 10 minutes into me waiting in line at the bar, I received a f two phone calls from a friend. What's the name of this friend? I'm, I'm sorry? What's the name of the friend? Ashley Jemison. Uh, can you spell that? Uh, A S H L E Y J E M I S O N. Uh, does this person go by other names? She has a stage name as well. What's the stage name? Her stage name is Aubrey Kate. Uh, and what happened at this point? The first phone call, when she called, I couldn't hear. It was a lot of loud commotion. It was chaotic. So I couldn't understand, and I hung up. And then 30 seconds later, I received another phone call from, from her as well. And all I could hear amongst the chaos or the, the sounds that were sort of the, the, the loud sounds was, get the F over here. What did you do? I immediately went to back to the line. And when you went back to the line, how far away is the line from the bar? Uh, we were, I was probably 25 yards away from that, that portion of where they were at in the line. Uh, once uh, you went back to the your original location, what did you see? It took me a couple of minutes to kind of weave through the different people that were standing there and, and blocking my, my route. Um, when I got there, I saw Amy and the defendant were walking away from the line together. And when you say the defendant, uh, you see the person you saw there that night here in court today? Yes. Can you please point him out for the jury and describe what that person is wearing today? Uh, he's wearing a blue suit and glasses. What we'll color shirt, sir? A white shirt as well. Right, don't find the defendant. And as you approached them, did you uh, hear anything being said? Initially seeing them walk away, I first checked in with my friend who called me, and she told me, this guy is freaking out on your friend. So I then walked over to where the two of them had walked to, and they had... You say the two of them? Uh, Dr. Amy and uh, Gareth Perthouse. And then as you walked over there, what, if any, did you hear? As I was walking towards them, the only words I heard was, you ruined my life, you bitch. And as I got closer, they both stopped, they both looked at me, and I checked in with her and said, is everything okay? And she said, everything's okay, I'm gonna be right here talking. And so I went back to the line um, and waited for her. I, I also said, I'll wait in line for you. And so I waited and kept her place. Now let's go back to the statement that you, what was the statement again? You ruined my life, you bitch. Looking here at people's photograph C of this exhibit, do you recognize who's shown there? Yes. And who is that? That's the defendant, Gareth Perthouse. Is that the way he looked uh, at the Expos Awards show on January 16th? Yes, I remember the red shirt and the jeans, yeah. And so how would you describe, were you able to see his face when he said, uh, you ruined my life, bitch? Uh, they were profiled, so they were looking at each other as I was walking up, so that they did not see me as that, I heard that. 
Were, were you able to see what his uh, demeanor was uh, when he said, you ruined my life? It was hostile and angry and elevated. And then when they both made eye contact that I was walking over, um, they both, like, put it back together. He, he calmed himself down very quickly in that moment. And then what happened? Uh, after I checked in and she shared that she was going to be there and talking, um, I went back to the red carpet and waited for about 45 minutes until we, I got closer to the entrance of the, the red carpet. And in the meantime, I was checking over at the two of them talking periodically, every minute or two minutes. Why were you, why were you doing that? I was concerned. What were you concerned about? Uh, the angry, hostile statement, if someone calls your friend a bitch, um, that was alarming to me. That was that raised a red flag for myself, and I wanted to make sure she was okay. So you kept a uh, uh, view of her. Yes, she was in the line of sight the entire time I was in uh, in the line. About how far away was she from you? Thirty to thirty-five yards. And did you see anything happen during that time when you're watching her? that distance? Um, obviously, I could not hear anything else because I'm so far away, but I could observe nonverbal movements for both of them. Um, I noticed she had her hands clasped together in her lap. Um, her, her, her two hands. Her two hands were clasped together, um, and she was uh, seated in a way that was kind of leaning into the conversation, so she was, um, in my opinion, non-threatening and trying to... Um, just looked calm. Uh, the defendant, Gareth Pursehouse, had much more animated movements with the hands. So there was times where the, he the hands went on the head, times when the hands covered the face and then were in his lap, bending, bending forward into his, his lap. Um, and there was just more movement to reinforce whatever was being said. Reflect that the witness was placing his hands in front of his face, a couple of inches up in front of his face, first above his head, then in front of his face, and then lean forward. All right, thank you. And what happened after that? The, a bell went off to signify that the show was starting, so it's like a five minute or a ten minute warning for people. What time was the show supposed to start? It's supposed to start, I think, at eight o'clock, but they ran late, so it was probably closer to nine. And what did you do once the bell rang? Uh, once the bell rang and I was very close to the red carpet, I, I just made the decision to walk over there and um, intervene and let her know, hey, the red carpet's about to close. This is your last chance. So I did walk up to them, um, and I interjected and said, the red carpet is about to close. Do you want to come do your pictures? I've been waiting in line this whole time. And she said, yeah, just give me a second. And then I moved away to give them their space, their... Uh, and went back to the line, and, um, and then she came over about two minutes later. And before she came over two minutes later, about approximately how long had she been talking to the defendant before that? About 45 minutes. Yeah. And how would you describe her demeanor once she left the defendant and met up with you? <clears throat> totally changed. What does that mean? She went from initially coming into the show excited, talkative, enthusiastic, um, you know, full of energy as, as she, we all typically know her if you're uh, in her life. And when she walked up to me, she was almost like a ghost. She was very stoic. I, I keep thinking back to the word that felt right, and it felt like she was on autopilot. She was just coasting and moving through the, the motions of walking and taking pictures and talking, but... Objection narration at this point, Your Honor. All right, and th th that'll, that'll stand. Uh, Counselor, your next question. Yes. Uh, did, was she able to take pictures on the red carpet? She did, yes. Looking here at people's photograph D. Do you recognize what's showing here? Yes. What is that? That is Dr. Amy on the red carpet. And it appears that she's smiling in the photograph. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, uh, when she wasn't taking photographs, did she appear happy? No. Why would you say that? It felt fake. It would be like me smiling right now. I don't feel like smiling, but I could if I needed to. 
and that's I, what I picked up from her, uh, a, f a fake expression to get through the pictures and the evening. And so after she took pictures at the red carpet, uh, <coughs> what happened after that? Uh, she moved along the red carpet. I also took photos as well of her, and I was kind of with her the entire way. Then we moved to our seats as we had um, a table that we were going to be sitting at. Look at that photograph. E, do you recognize what's shown there? Yes, this is the ballroom at the Marriott where the awards were held. Okay, and so would you have a table in this area? Yes, we had uh, two seats at the table at, right in front of the picture. Looking at photograph F. Recognize what's shown here? Yes. Can you tell us what is shown here? That is myself and Dr. Amy seated together at the table taking a photo. This is a selfie? Or someone took this for us? It might be a selfie. Yeah, it looks like my arm. Uh, and so, how would you describe her demeanor at the time now that she's at the table? Loss of energy, unenthusiastic. Um, not non not talkative, um, a very different person than who arrived there. Did you see her take photos with friends? She did take some photos with people. Yeah. And about how long did this show last? The show was approximately two hours. And did anything happen before uh, the conclusion of the show? About ten minutes before the show ended, and we know that it ends because there's a program. Um, the defendant, Gareth Pursehouse, approached our table and knelt down next to Amy and spoke in her ear. Could you hear what he was saying to her? I could not. And did anything happen as a result of that? After they e exchanged a, a quick conversation, she turned to me and said, we're going to keep talking after the show. So what happened? Uh, so then the show ended and she told me where she was going to be, which was the same bench, um, the same area where she, they were speaking before the show. Um, and because that area had everyone leaving, the, the ballroom was going to be walking by that area. It was very public, um, and she felt safe there, and we agreed that's where she would Objection. speak. Objection. Well, well uh, the court will allow, not, not, not on that uh, grounds, so the court will allow and allow to stand. So uh, we don't see where they went to go talk. I remained in the ballroom for some time. Uh, at some point, were you able to see where they went to go talk? Yes, I did go check on her. And what point was that? Um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes into the, the ending of the show. And what did you see? I saw them seated at the same bench, continuing their conversation. How would you describe Amy Harwood's demeanor during that conversation? Very similar. Um, I, I call it therapist mode. She was um, engaged, and you could see a de-escalation experience of her trying to navigate and calm the situation. Objection. Speculation. Well, did you uh, sustain, and unless you heard the conversation? Motion is right. Oh, well done. Did you hear the conversation? I did not hear any conversation. Okay, so you're basing that on what? Nonverbal observation. Uh, I'm going to sustain the objection. It's stricken. <clears throat> How would you describe the defendant's demeanor when you observe him uh, what appeared to be talking to Ms. Harwood? You know, in that moment, I just checked to make sure they were seated there and then went back to um, and left. So I didn't take a lot of time to see the nonverbal of the of their conversations outside of the two of them talking and leaning into each other. And the location where they were talking, mm -hmm. where is there uh, traffic around? Uh, people traffic. A lot of traffic and a lot of people walking by there. Why? Why would you say that? It was to leave the ballroom. You'd have to take this corridor to the escalator that would take you downstairs to the lobby area. So everyone had to go through the escalator, or they could walk a lot farther and go down the elevator. So you had to walk by them. And at some point, did you go talk to Amy Harwood while she was talking to the defendant? 
We exchanged text messages, so I didn't approach the two of them. I only sent messages to check in and ask how you're doing. Are you okay? And she would respond, we're still talking, or I'm okay. How long, how much time did that go on? Probably about 30 minutes after the show ended. Um, most people had already left, so I moved out towards the area that they were at. Um, and I grabbed a chair and I sat down and just was in the line of sight. Just kind of waiting and watching. I'm, I'm, just to be clear, you said 30 minutes. Were you referring to how long co the second conversation took? Uh, from the end of the show to the time I moved out to sit down in that outside area where they were talking was yes. about 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And so now you're seated uh, watching uh, Dr. Howard and the defendant talk. Yes. And how long does that go on? Probably for another 20 minutes. And so you're able to see him? Yes. And after 20 minutes, what, what happens? Uh, nobody was left. Um, the cleaning crew was picking up the tables, and registration had been broken down, the, the registration tables and area. I just felt like it was time to go, that this had been a long time, and um, so I decided to walk up to them and let her know that I think it's time to wrap up, and we should get going. About what time was this, approximately? About midnight. And so did you do that? Yes. What, what did you say? Uh, just like that, I think it's time for you two to wrap up. We should be getting going. And gave them another couple of minutes to wind down and wrap up their conversation. And then the two of them stood up. And then her and I proceeded to walk towards um, to the escalator and then go downstairs to her car. This would be the, the parking lot? There's a parking structure that uh, underneath the hotel, yes. And did you make it to that car? Yes, we did. We arrived at her car. And on the way there, did anything happen? Uh, she didn't want to talk. And, what does uh, that mean, she didn't want to talk? I was just asking, how did things go? What was that all about? Um, and she didn't really want to speak. Um, she wanted to, she was in a hurried rush to get to the car. And so did you rush to the car? We did. And we didn't stop anywhere, talk to anyone. We just went directly to the car. And when you got to the car, did anything happen? Once we sat down in the car, she had this big sigh and she then told me who it was because originally she had just said it's an ex um, and then she shared with me which ex it was and in that moment we um, talked about uh, she mentioned I'm not going to this burlesque show any longer I told her I won't go see any other friends okay. and we mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, so Oh, it was overruled. Sorry. It was. Yeah. Oh. So we decided to go to a diner to talk. And before leaving the parking lot to go to the diner, did anything happen? Did she express anything? She was scared and worried she was going to be followed. How do you know that? She told me. And both her and I both looked in the side mirrors and turned our heads to make sure no one was following us outside of the parking structure. Did she indicate to you who she feared would follow her? Yes. What did she say? Gareth. And where did you go after that? We got on the freeway and we went to a diner in Burbank called Bob's Big Boy. What time is this when you get to the Bob's diner, Bob's table? Approximately 12.30 a.m. While at the diner, does she tell you anything related to her fear that night? She told me the story of the interaction, of what they talked about, um, and her fear and her being afraid. Tell us what she told you in regards to her fear. She told me that she was scared, that she had long felt fear uh, regarding this ex. Um, yeah. And did she tell you that whether anything from that particular night caused her fear? Um, th because she had shared that they had not spoken for a number of years, this brought up a lot, a wave of fear. And a big part. Let me, let me stop you there. Um, 
uh, did she indicate to you whether she was going to take any precautions as a result of having this fear? A big part of our conversation was how to protect yourself. From Can you tell the jury what you and her discussed about protecting her? about her protecting herself. We discussed boundaries and a safety plan. And within that safety plan, we discussed having someone reinforce her locks, both on her doors and windows. We discussed her getting mace or pepper spray. We discussed her getting a taser and also the possibility of her purchasing a gun to, for protection. So she expressed to you that she felt those things were necessary to protect herself? Yes. And protect herself from who? From Gareth Burt's house. How long were you at the diner with her talking about this? About two hours. We left around 2.30 a.m. How did you feel about her telling you this, that she wants to get a pepper spray, a gun, and all that? Objection relevance? Interesting. How was her demeanor when she's telling you? Her demeanor? Yes. When she's telling you, she's thinking about getting pepper spray, taser gun, a gun. Very different than the Amy I knew. The Amy I knew had a lot of confidence and empowerment and strength, and she was frail and fragile and scared and worried. How long were you there at the Bob's table? Approximately two hours. And after that, what happened? Uh, after that, we wrapped up our meal she dropped me off at home but as we were leaving i offered um to stay with her if she would like me to stay at her house with her why did you do that uh, i was concerned and fearful for her she was obviously scared and frightened but also we're having these incredibly deep and painful conversations around safety plans and protecting herself um, so i wanted to offer that and and i felt the protective instinct of that coming up for myself so when you offer that, what did she tell you? She told me she feels comfortable because she has a male roommate at her home and there wasn't a need for me to stay over. And so uh, she, did she drop you off at home? She dropped me off at my uh, home and then she went home. And we exchanged text messages when she arrived. And sometime after that, did you and her start exchanging other types of text messages? The next day, she sent me a few messages um, following up with both our conversation and also updates. I'm going to show you People's Exhibit 10 Photograph G. You see that there? Yes, I do. And uh, do you recognize what's shown here? Yes, I do. And what, what is it? This is Dr. Amy messaging me on January 17th, the following day after the awards show, um, that Gareth found her number online. And is this a text uh, exchange you were receiving from Amy Harwick around uh, January 17th, 2020 at about 1.22 p.m.? Yes. And some... Obviously, some parts here are blocked out. You did not do that. I did not do that, no. Uh, but to get to this, for example, there, there appears to be one text with the date of January 17, 2020, 122 p.m., and then there's another screenshot of a text in the middle. Do you see that? Yes. Who, whose text message is that? Uh, Amy's messages are on the left, which are not blacked out, and my messages are on the right, which appear to be blacked out. And ladies and gentlemen, the reason it's blocked out, uh, out is the court has ruled on the admissibility of it, so you're not to speculate w what it was uh, and the reasons why it was blocked out, if you would. Okay? Go ahead, Counselor. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> is this the message you received from her around 1.22 p.m.? Gareth found my number online and messaged me. I told him I didn't want to talk and wish him the best but his response was still obsessive and scary. Handyman comes tomorrow for more locks on my windows and ordered pepper spray. Yes, that was Dr. Amy's text message to me. Okay, and you, you uh, uh, gave her a response? Yes, I did. Okay, and then she texts you back after that, what appears to be on the right side. Thanks, I sent a boundary text and I'm not responding after that. 
He keeps texting me and sounds unstable. That is Dr. Amy's text message to me. Your Honor, may we briefly approach? Briefly. Ladies and gentlemen, let's call it a day. Uh, we're going we're gonna to remain here and discuss an issue here. Um, back tomorrow at 940. Have a safe evening. We'll see you. Uh, stay off the uh, internet uh, and social media if you would. Thank you. Have a good evening.